On today's show, we find out who our MVP is, why the AFC title game could be very interesting, and how in the world did we manage a two seed after starting the season three and four, including losing to the three worst teams in football. All that and plenty more, you're inside the Johnny Dell Football Academy. You can also listen to this podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and we'll have the link in the description below. Hello, Niner Faithful, and welcome to the Johnny Dell Football Academy podcast on the channel that's trying to find out the whys and hows of the game. As always, I am Adam Marino, and joining me is the man, the myth, the legend for episode one of the new year of our brand new podcast, Mr. Johnny Dell. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. You know, we ended the season on a great win. Uh, it was one of those games, I think we, we were all worried uh, for the first couple minutes. Is this a trap game? It, it reminded me a lot of the Rams game after the Chiefs, right? We get just decimated by the Chiefs. The defense looks terrible. And then we come up versus the Rams, and it starts out the first two drives like, oh, here we go. It's happening again. And coming off a game where the Raiders just seem to put up points at will – and then watch the Cardinals go down on a flea flicker for the first opening play of the game. And then uh, they, they score two touchdowns and it's 13 to 14 and we're going, here we go again. But then just like the Rams game after that, it was over. The, the team got their head straight and they dialed in and ran away with it. I was uh, embarrassed looking back at my tweets at the beginning of the game because I was pretty frustrated. We had a turnover, and I said, well, the good news is we got a turnover. The bad news is the offense has to go back on the field because even offensively, we just weren't getting it together at first. But obviously, we put it on them. We're not going to spend a ton of time on that game because, as my mom had said, we were playing a blousy quarterback. So um, we knew that once the second half started for sure that we were going to put it on them, and we did. We secured the two seed. So let's get into the schedule release of the playoffs. We knew that we were in. We just didn't know exactly the rundown, and we were talking right before we were recording. The NFL does think that we are going to blow out the Seahawks. Because they've actually scheduled us for, as you know, and as most should know, hopefully we're not breaking news, but Saturday at 1.30 um, game time for our 49ers, which is the very first game of of the playoffs. And then after that is the Chargers and Jaguars at Jacksonville. Um, shout out to Jacksonville for getting the home playoff game. I mean, winning that terrible division. And then Sunday, we get things rolling with the Dolphins at Bills. We'll figure out what Tua Tagovailoa is doing. Uh, the Giants at the Vikings is next. And then the Ravens and Bengals play the Sunday night cap. And then Monday night football is the Dallas Cowboys against Tom Brady and his Buccaneers. So that is the playoff rundown. Real quick, what game jumps out at you we will get into a deeper look at 49er Seahawks on Thursday so we're just going a brief overview of everything what game jumps out at you uh a game that jumps out at me and probably not for the reason that most people would think is the Buccaneers and Cowboys simply because I wonder if the NFL will ever reconsider that division champions get home get a home playoff game no matter what because how is it that with the great disparity in records between the Cowboys and the Buccaneers now I'm not I'm not pulling for the Cowboys to get a home playoff game uh, I think we all know many people's feelings about the Cowboys in 49er land but uh, the idea that the Cowboys with their record are going to travel to face the Buccaneers at home with their record. That does seem a little bit off. And so I just wonder, and and that's the Buccaneers with a home playoff game playing in maybe 
the second worst division in football, the worst division of football. I mean, it's it's hard. I think as crazy as it sounds, we went into the season thinking that the NFC was the best division in football. And now we're wondering, was it one of the worst divisions in football? Uh, it still came out with two playoff teams, but the other two teams were terrible this year. Right. I mean, implosion. Now, the NFC South just seemed like it was a bunch of bumbling idiots that couldn't couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag. Uh, and <laughs> and that Tampa Bay just happened to be the least worst team that came out of there. So that's a game that, that sticks out to me, just wondering, um, is the NFL going to have this conversation again? Uh, because that does just seem a little unfair. I know if it was us, if we were a team that had as many wins as the Cowboys did and had to go on the road versus a team that was barely over 500. I mean, they were 500 coming in. If this was a 16 game season, they're a 500 team. Like Seattle. What if we had to go to Seattle? That's what it would they be were like. nine and eight. Yeah. It, it reminds me of when the saints had to go play the Seahawks when they were seven and nine, they were below a 500 team. I, I think we're going to see that conversation again. Yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to see, the only reason why, as a Cowboy hater, the only reason I think it's okay because Dak has thrown a pick in seven straight games, so screw him. I Like, play, be better. <laughs> but, of course, you know, I, I have my blinders on, but and that's okay. That's what this show is for, is for people who have blinders about our Niners, right? So if you don't like it, I'm, there's plenty of other shows for you. <laughs> so let's get into an overview of our season. We wrapped up the season yesterday and so I want to kind of go through maybe some of the highlights and th and things that stuck out to you this season so I think the obvious thing is the pickup of Christian McCaffrey and the how that's changed the offense and that was kind of a work in progress from when he came in people don't understand with our run game how much practice and time is put into the run game people will get enamored with the passing game and think it's all about the passing game but just rewind it back and look at at chicago and the beginning of the seattle game and how kyle was using trey lance i was telling people for a long time that trey lance was brought here so we could run the ball kyle wants to run the ball now he wants to be balanced that's that's the goal but when you look at explosives in the run game, there is no team that's better at creating explosives in the run game than the 49ers. That's not a homer out view. Uh, that's just the facts. And we were running the ball at an incredibly high rate when Trey Lance was here. Now, part of that, and Kyle said, was the hope would be that Trey would, would learn how to play quarterback through the season and you'd be able to build the passing game outwards from that. But it was going to start with running the ball. Think about the offseason that this team had, how much time was put into running the ball. If they were coming out of the gate running at such a high clip, every practice, every OTA, everything in the offseason was weighted towards learning how was practicing running the ball. And then you have the quarterback go down. And then you you have Elijah, you have Elijah Mitchell go down which he had gone down the week before but he's been out and then you bring in a new guy that was not there for any of this if I, I i saw it on film and i believe for a while that it was going to take time it was going to take time to gel but once it came together you could see the potential that was there that once it came together the offense was going to take off like a rocket i think i said that um after the Saints game, I, it was either after the Saints game or the Chargers game that I felt like the team was really, really close to taking off like a rocket offensively. And it was just a few things here and there that had to come together. And we've seen that over the past four or five games. We've seen that the offense has taken off like a rocket like I thought it would once you get McCaffrey really ingratiated into the offense and you get everything worked out. So uh, to me, that is the number one thing that's come away from this season because that's something that will reverberate not just this season but into next season and the next season because we have McCaffrey locked up. He's under a contract, and we and by giving up the picks we did, we actually have him on a cheaper, much cheaper contract than he ever was with Carolina because they had to eat so much of that uh, signing bonus. So to me, that is the number one takeaway from this season, the regular season, is just adding McCaffrey and and getting him into the offense because now we're set up to play January football. 
So let's talk Brock Purdy, man. Like what? I, I don't even know how to get started with the superlatives and the hyperbole and the situation. When you look at teams who have had to start multiple quarterbacks this season and teams like the Dolphins, the Texans just come to mind off off the bat. And one of those teams was very bad. And one of those teams is Niner Southeast, as I call them, right, uh, who made the playoffs. So look at some of these teams that started multiple quarterbacks and not to say they stumbled. They fell off a cliff. And you look at what happens with Brock Purdy. What where do you where do you start on Brock Purdy? I think the biggest place to start, because quarterback is such a sticky conversation among 49ers fans, uh, we tend to get divided over quarterbacks no matter what. And there's a Jimmy crowd, there's a Trey crowd, now there's a rumblings of a Purdy crowd. And I, I, what I'm, I, I think we all need to step back and, and really examine is that Brock Purdy, through all these starts, we are having the conversation about whether or not he should be the quarterback next year. There is no other team that is putting their third quarterback in that is having that conversation. The fact that we're even having that conversation should speak volumes to the fan base. Just, just step back and think about that. Because the Cardinals are not talking about McSorley as the quarterback next year. Nobody's talking about that. We're on our third quarterback, who was the last pick in the draft, and it's a debate among fans. Should he be the, the quarterback next year, or is it going to be Trey Lance, the guy who was picked third overall? The fact that we're having that conversation is not a knock on Trey Lance. That just shows you how much we have accomplished with Brock Purdy. And like you said, every other team has fallen off of a cliff when they've had to go to their third quarterback. For us, it feels just like we're rolling. It just feels, I mean, that cannot be overstated. And what I've seen is I almost feel like some of what we're seeing, like I said, is is the offense gelling. Some of it I feel like is Kyle has had to go back and say, we really need to out-scheme teams. I feel like that has gone to a different level. Um, what I'm reminded of is just when I go back and watch the Saints game, what I saw in that game now, it was coming off of a very short week. The team didn't get in until like 6 in the morning on Tuesday morning. I think that was a – I like the idea that they wanted to do a Mexico City game. But if you're going to do that, do it on Sunday night. Don't do it on Monday night because of the travel issues. Um, yeah. So, you know, that that was a short week. But what I, what I saw when I watched that game was it was like Kyle was just kind of – calling a lot of a lot of diverse pass plays relying on Jimmy Garoppolo to make the right reads and throws and the protection to hold up which was the protection was struggling we didn't run the ball well and when we didn't run the ball well he just kind of said okay well we'll throw it and we'll we'll get yards and we'll let our defense be our defense i feel like after that game he he said we need more cohesive game plans and whatever happened behind the scenes there, because it feels like since the Saints game that our game plans have been more cohesive, they've been more effective, um, because the next one was the Dolphins game, and that's when we really started to take off. And so, you know, I, I, I feel like there's that, but the fact that we can be see, feel so seamless in going through is a testament to Kyle Shanahan and to Brock Purdy. I mean, Brock Purdy, what he has done, you cannot deny what we're seeing, you know, uh, you're talking on the second longest streak of quarterbacks of a of a 49ers quarterback throwing two or more touchdowns in a game. Um, the only person he's behind now is Jeff Garcia. The two people he's ahead of are Joe Montana and Steve Young. I mean, we're talking NFL royalty. Now, I, I'm I'm the type that um, generally I'm going to pump the brakes until I'm really really convinced on something. Uh, but he just. You keep waiting for Brock Purdy to revert to the mean or revert to expectations uh, being the last pick in the draft, but it doesn't happen. He keeps just performing. The offense keeps just throwing points up on the board. And, you know, it, it's it's fascinating. The biggest thing I think you've also seen with Purdy coming in and, and down the stretch this season is we have gotten so much better in the red zone because 
so we we had the potential to put up points like this all season and it was like we would we would run into this issue or that that issue in the red zone if you think back to the chiefs game right uh we scored two touchdowns and three field goals if you if you have those as touchdowns you have 35 points and then we threw an interception in in the red zone okay that's 42 points left on the field you're in it with the chiefs who's you know in that game that's what we expect from all these other games 35 points that's what we're that's about what we're averaging with all these other games the difference is we're we've turned those field goals into touchdowns and that's been the the, the offensive production between the 20s has been pretty much the same and again that's a testament to Brock Purdy and what he's done and handled the situations handled what they're giving him and the team rallying around and saying we're we're going to really run the ball well we're gonna take pride in this and do this better and Kyle just has been in his bag and it's been fun and as a 49ers fan what more could you want I mean (laughs) there has never been a a team I can ever think of that is on their quarterback number three and are still considered a Super Bowl contender I mean we've seen them with with quarterback two but we've never seen a team with quarterback three be considered as as a Super Bowl contender, that's the number two seed after starting three and four. I mean, come on! If Kyle doesn't win Coach of the Year this year, I that there's some. I think we all need to to write a Revolt. strongly worded letter to the NFL, <laughs> Mr. Goodell. We disagree, sir. So let's also get into the another huge reason why we have the two seed, and that is the defense. What can you say about? The defense and our 17 interceptions alone is an amazing stat to me. But what else What else can you add about our defense? You know, the defense is like you said, the difference between our defense between this year and last year is the turnovers. Last year, we were terrible at creating turnovers. And, and you know, some of that is luck. Some of that is just things not bouncing the right way. Uh, I, th- I think that, you know, if it wasn't for Josh Norman and turning into the second coming of peanut Tillman, we would, we might've been one of the worst teams in the league last year in creating turnovers. I, I can't remember how many fumbles that Josh Norman forced. He was like the only person taking the ball away, which was crazy because he was also the only person that teams would throw at because it was a pass interference every time. <laughs> but it was like, he was, e- it was either he was getting a pass interference, picking the ball off or forcing a fumble. It was, that was it. Um, and, and more often than not, it was pass interference, but this year you're seeing one, we're getting production from the safeties. Uh, we all know what a safety not being able to catch an interception can cost you. Um, you're going to bring that no, up. No, huh? I'm not bringing it up. I'm not bringing it up. That is the play that we shall not talk about. It has been cast into the abyss and it is in the past. Uh, it but, leaves a sour tart taste. Oh, I, I wasn't gonna say it, <laughs> but yes. No, the turnover differential is huge because when we went to the Super Bowl with Jimmy, we were a plus four, and now this year we're a plus thirteen. That's huge. It's huge because we haven't been turning the ball over. What you know, be it from the quarterback position, from the running back position, from the wide receivers. You look at even earlier in in the year, some of the struggles we had were on in games where we had multiple turnovers. And I mean, you go back to the Atlanta game because I we you know we were talking about it before about how does how do the 49ers lose to three of the worst teams in the NFL? And you go back to the Atlanta game and you, and you have to think about Jeff Wilson's fumble that was returned for a touchdown. You know, that was a huge play in that game. That that was went from the 49ers were going to roll and tie it 7 to 7 to we're down 14-0 and we're playing from behind the whole time. And then the defense starts pressing. The defense was decimated with injuries, right? Um, right. And then there's there's we had an interception later after we have three huge drops. You know, it's just it was shooting yourself in the foot the whole time. Um, you go back to the Denver game, two really bad turnovers. I mean, that was Jimmy's first start of the year after no off season, no training camp, two really bad, really costly turnovers that pro- you know you look at and you, you can't help but think did that cost us the number one seed? Um, but you know it's in the past. We can't change it. You can go forward. Uh, I be- I'm believing that the Eagles are going to get bounced before we play them. I think the NFC Championship game is going to play- be played in San Francisco. But, um, you know, just that that situation that the defense, yes, they have had a couple of rough games. But overall, every- you look at every great defense, there's always one or two games in their schedule where you go, wow, 
How did you, when you look back on it and you go, wow, how did that happen? You go look at the 2000 Ravens, okay, best defense in the history of football. You'll see there's some games in there where there's more points given up than you would expect when you think about the 2000 Ravens. I remember there's one, I think they gave up like 34 points in a game. And you're going, wait a minute. I thought that was the 2000 Ravens. They didn't they didn't allow things like that. But yes, they did. Every once in right. a while, that can happen. We just tend to look back on that without remembering the bad. We only remember the really good. I think the 2022 49ers defense is going to be remembered for all the good. And there's going to be a few sour fans who will remember the two bad games. Let's talk about what will be remembered for hopefully defensive player of the year, right, in Bosa. Yeah, so, you know, uh, to me, I don't see how you don't give Bosa Defensive Player of the Year. And and this speaks to sometimes impressions of, of fans or, or people who talk about the 49ers that we can get so locked into, like, with a defensive end or edge guy, sacks, and that's it. That sacks is the end-all, be-all stat to to tell you how great of a season is. So, uh, you know, I retweeted um, a guy, he's a content creator, Ryan Hensley, he that he had put up uh, showing how Alden Smith had 19 and a half sacks in 2012 and that it was hard to imagine that Alden had a better season that year hard to wrap his mind hard to wrap his mind around that Alden had a better season in 2012 than Bosa's had this year and and I retweeted that it's an interesting conversation to have because I, I don't I, I think that's too narrow focused on it I think the conversation is a lot more nuanced than that. I think there's a lot more to talk about in that because it is easy to just sit there and say, yeah, it's sacks, but Alden Smith had 19 and a half sacks. He had a better season. Bosa had 18 and a half. But we have to start going back and looking at different contexts of things. One, if you look at edge players in the NFL, you cannot tell me there is a single edge player better against the run than Nick Bosa. There's not a single one. I would I would challenge anybody find an edge defender that is better against the run than Nick Bosa. You are not going to find one. So there's that. There's also the you know, and not to sound like Emmanuel Acho, but uh, impact on the game is we know why why did we win in overtime versus the Raiders? It was after an interception that was thrown after Nick Bosa pressures the quarterback. When you start looking at the stats of defensive players that are double teamed, Nick Bosa leads the league. Okay. So he is drawing more attention than anybody. When you look at that, Nick Bosa was playing without Eric Armstead or Javon Kinlaw, his starting defensive tackles for eight games this year. And he still puts up the production he did. When you look at Alden Smith's year, I always look at it and I always, to me, have a little bit of a caveat with those 19 and a half sacks because he had five and a half in one game versus Chicago that he had he had one of the best games that anybody's ever had. Now you strip that back and he had 14 sacks in 15 games. Nick Bosa had 18 and a half sacks in 17 games. He had 17 and a half sacks in 16 games, right? Alden Smith went six games that year without a sack. Nick Bosa went three games this year without a sack. That's a big difference. That's showing consistency in production. Alden Smith also had Justin Smith holding the offensive lineman the whole time, which we loved. I mean, we loved as, as Niner fans. But again, when you look at that, Nick Bosa played without Eric Armstead and Javon Kinlaw for eight games. Alden Smith had Justin Smith next to him for 16 games. Okay, if you had if if Nick Bosa had Justin Smith next to him for 16 games, he's at 21 sacks. He's at 21 and a half sacks. Right. I I think there's more to it than just saying, well, he just had he had one less sack. And I go, no, I think I, to me, Alden was a great player and he was pro he may be the best pure pass rusher the 49ers ever had. But when you look at a complete player a player that impacts the, the game around him, that changes the way the offense has to play, Nick Bosa is that guy. He's a generational talent. He will he he better win Defensive Player of the Year this year. He's going to get a $33, $34 million a year contract. Um, and that's just what it's going to be. He's going to get an Aaron Donald type contract. When you look around the NFL and you say most disruptive players on the defensive line, who is it? 
the answers are there's going to be two names that come up. That's Nick Bosa and Aaron Donald. That's the the list when you when you start putting it. If you gave a put a vote out there and said who are the two most disruptive defensive line players in the league, it's going to be either one or two, Nick Bosa or Aaron Donald. And that's it. Alden Smith was never in that conver- that same sort of conversation. He was in the same sort of conversation as a great pass rusher, but I don't think he was ever in the conversation like you were never talking about him like a Khalil Mack. You were talking about him like he was a great pass rusher, but you were never talking about the co- kind of complete player that changed the entire game the way that Nick Bosa does. No question. And <clears throat> I want to stay with the defense and let you guys know a little bit more about our show. In the the links in the show notes and all that, we'll provide all of the ways that you can get a hold of us, our Twitter, our Facebook, our Instagram, all of that fun stuff, as well as the best way to get a hold of us is Johnny Dell's Football Academy at gmail.com. And the reason I say that is because we will have a mailbag, right? So we start off this week. Randall Schaefer the third has emailed us a question for Johnny, and it relates to the defense. So, like I said, we are going to stick with the defense. And so Randall's question is what do you feel has made the 49ers defense leave teams unable to perform in the following week as we know teams are 0 and 15 so is it their speed strength game preparation in the film room or a combination of these and why well i think number one teams what what D'Amico ryan's is really good at is taking away what teams do best and and the games that we haven't done that, those are the games that we've struggled. So for the the Raiders, for example, uh, everyone talks about how great Stidham was, but the engine that dro- drove that car was the Raiders' run game, and we weren't able to contain their run game uh, and until the second half. And I showed it in my review video. Really, the second half, it feels like the Raiders did a lot more, but we're talking about like three crazy plays. There was the one broke, big broken play where Devontae Adams, it's, it was an off-schedule scramble drill play, and he goes for like 70 yards. And then there was the big giant heave, which everyone's going, it was it a catch? Was it not a catch? Those two plays, and, and then there was a jump ball to Devontae Adams in the end zone. Those three plays were the Raiders' offense in the second half. I mean, that was it. When, when you look at the first half, they were just driving down the field. Why? Because they were running the ball. In the second half, we played much, much better against the run. We ended up uh, holding up very well and shut down the engine that drove that car. Once we shut down that engine, Jarrett Stidham was not nearly as effective as he was. It was literally just coming down to these kind of crazy plays that happen. And I think what they do is that they show teams, one, how you stop an opposing team's run game. And then two, uh, what happens after that? And and I think there's also the um, the emotional aspect when teams when you come when you go to face the 49ers defense, teams know it. You got to buckle in, and you got to strap in, and you got to prepare every week. You got to be on every last thing. Coordinators are going to be into every bag of tricks that they have. Like we saw Cliff Kingsbury pulling out the flea flicker uh, this last week. You see that teams are really getting up and saying, this is a game we're going to circle and saying, this will show how good an, how measure where we are in as, as an offense going against the best defense in the league. And I think there can be a letdown coming off of that. And I think there's a, the physicality of the team that they just beat teams up. And so I, I think there's that's that's a lot of it is that it just it takes so much effort to do anything on this 49ers offense or defense that I think they kind of uh, spend themselves on it and and it takes them a week to recover. I really really do. Uh, and D'Amico Ryan's is one of the best minds in football that we have right now as far as defensive minds. Um, you know when people talk about Kyle Shanahan as a as an offensive genius, when I look at D'Amico Ryans, I say on the defensive side of the ball, he's an emerging Kyle Shanahan because of of how smart he is defensively. And I think that goes underrated because of the amount of talent we have, but it's not just the talent we have. The, th- the ways that he schemes things up, he's usually got an answer for, wh- for whatever the offense has. Now, uh, 
when teams score, sometimes they beat us schematically, but it is very rare that it's actually schematically beat. When is it, most of the time if we're beat, it was an execution error somewhere. For sure. <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see. Uh, I mean, like I said, we've seen it even last year. Our team matches up physically with anyone. You look at the Packers in the playoffs. We go to Green Bay, super cold. We're not supposed to win, and we take it to them because we're physical. And that's what speaks to that is how physical this team is. And so moving forward in the playoffs, that's why we like our chances. So thank you to Randall for the question. Again, email us. All that stuff will be in the show notes, and you can take a look at that to get a hold of us. We definitely want to be interactive. So I also want to get into we we talk about – the who we think will be in the NFC championship game obviously is the 49ers. Let's go a little final four. So who is your final four? And also regarding the AFC, did you hear the goofiness of where what's going on with the AFC championship game? All right. So when it comes to the AFC championship game, the easiest way to explain it is if there's any combination of the Chiefs, Bills, Bengals in the championship game it's going to be at a neutral site which in the end i think is the best solution for the problem you can't you can't push the playoffs back one week everyone was saying well maybe you should push the playoffs back one week right no it's not gonna happen that that's unacceptable that too much money involved too much money too much scheduling involved uh i mean you're talking now you have to push the super bowl back a week uh when you have everybody's travel plans, I mean, you're talking about thousands and thousands of people that already have travel plans already made, and now you're pushing everything back a week. You can't do that. So I understand, you know, the, and so try, and then trying to ask the Bills and the Bengals to f- squeeze a game in before, right before the playoffs. I mean, what were they going to do? Play on Wednesday and then try and turn around and like move their games to Monday night or something in the playoffs? I, I don't right. think so. That, that that's unacceptable. There was no other solution than this way. So uh, I, I think it was the best out of a bad situation. But it was it absolutely needed to happen. There was no way you could ask the Bills and Bengals to keep playing that night or uh, to make up that game. So um, that'll be an interesting situation. As far as Final Four, you're talking about for the NFC. Uh, the final four, I think, I think the final four is going to be, because we're talking about the divisional round, uh, I think it's going to be Minnesota, the 49ers, the Eagles, and the Cowboys. And and so I put out a tweet, and Eric Davis didn't agree with me, but I tagged him in it, uh, and he responded, uh, I see a second coming of 1994. I'm believing it. I'm just, if if no other reason for the romantic idea of it. But I do see a path for as much as I, as you said, that um, that Dak Prescott has been cheeks recently, uh, that um, I do see a path for the Cowboys to get to the NFC Championship game. And I think, because, yes, we want to believe that the, that the Cowboys are just cheeks and it's not going to happen, uh, but they're facing a... Tampa Bay team that is not good. They are not a good team. Now, they have the greatest quarterback of all time. Uh, some 49ers fans will still disagree with me on that. It's hard to argue against seven Lombardis. At least he's from the Bay Area, guys. That's Can right. we just That's say, right. like, hey, San he's Francisco a Niner fan. has home to the best quarterbacks ever. Let's just <laughs> yeah. agree with that. But I don't see the I don't see Tampa Bay having enough to, to get over. Dallas is a talented team. Now, I don't think they're a team that is built to win a championship. Um, But Dallas is a talented team. I don't see Tampa Bay, with as bad as they've been this whole season, being able to put it together and beat the Cowboys. So I see the Cowboys beating the Buccaneers. And then that means that you're going to have the Cowboys taking on, uh, as long as Minnesota doesn't lose this week, which I don't see Minnesota losing to the Giants. The Giants are a team that is punching above their weight, and they don't have a quarterback, I believe, that can help them overcome some of their deficiencies. Um, right. So I don't see Minnesota losing to to the Giants. So that means you're going to have Dallas playing a divisional opponent in Philadelphia that they tend to match up fairly well against. Um, and I think they can knock off Philly. I think Philly's going to come out a little rusty, uh, being sitting for a week. Um, and I think that 
I think Dallas matches up well against Philly, and I think they knock Philly off, and I think it's going to be NFC Championship game in San, in Santa Clara, 49ers versus the Cowboys. That's how I see the pathway to this. That is 1994 all over again. 1994, we got blown out by the Phil- Philadelphia Eagles early in the season. It changed this, the, the trajectory of the season. When you look at can, can, the Kansas City game, we get blown out by the Kansas City Chiefs. We have not lost a game since. Now, the only other thing that would be better is if the Chargers could somehow make it to the Super Bowl <laughs> out of the AFC. It would be 1994 all over again, and we know how that ended. So, uh, six Lombardi confirmed. So, <laughs> we don't see the Chargers in the in the AFC Championship. Who do you have in the AFC Championship? It's hard to argue against the Bills, Chiefs. I do think the Bengals have a, have a legit shot, though. I mean, they have been a team. They, they remind me so much of us that they're surging at the right time. And right. they've been coming together at the right time. And, you know, the Ravens, who they're nobody. Re- they aren't really telling us what's really going on with Lamar Jackson. And I don't think Lamar Jackson wants people to really know what's going on with Lamar Jackson. He's in a contract year. Right. right. He's chasing that giant contract with the Ravens. I, I feel like that. They don't even know for sure in their building exactly what's going on with Lamar Jackson. Right. So I think that's why none of us know what's really going on there. Uh, But the Bengals are a team that, man, they have all the pieces of a championship team. We saw it last year. They made they did the same thing, surged at the down the stretch at the end of the year and made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, You know, are they uh, this generation's bills uh, from the early 90s? Maybe. Uh, you know, the Bills went to three straight Super Bowls and lost. Um, are the Bengals going to be that team? They're, are they going to go to a second straight Super Bowl and lose? I mean, because we know if, if they go to the Super Bowl, they're going to lose because we're going to be in the Super Bowl and win. So, um, <laughs> right, right. You know, anybody who goes to the Super Bowl from the AFCs, the, just pack it up. You might as well not even go. The 49ers are going to beat you. All right. So, shout out to one of my favorite shows of all time, PTI. We'll get you out of here on this. Start bench cut we're gonna do mvp edition all right so i have three guys who could be looked at as our team's mvp all right and you have to start one you got to bench one and you got to cut one all right so the three players that i think could be looked at as mvps for our team is Christian McCaffrey, Fred Warner, and Nick Bosa. So I need you to start one, I need you to bench one, and I need you to cut one, and we'll get you out of here on this. Ouch. Uh, Ooh, that's a tough one. That is tough. We did some pre-shows, guys, that are not going to see the light of day. And just to see, you know, get in the flow of recording – and I threw him some softballs. And so I told him once we go for real, this is the first episode. It's time to bring it. Start Christian McCaffrey. Um, just because he is the engine that runs that offense. Um, you can make some argument that with Elijah Mitchell, but I think if, if you're talking about somebody elevating an offense he's a cheat code let's he's a I cheat mean, code i mean he is a cheat code you, you said it you, yeah we saw it yesterday uh you texted me that yeah <laughs> kyle, and I, I tweeted it out too i think um you know kyle just gives a little dump off screen to christian mccaffrey and he goes for like 25 yards and a touchdown like that's um, not supposed to happen yeah no it's like bo jackson and tech mobile <laughs> right it, it, i mean he is bo jackson and tech mobile it is and, and you, you look at uh yards from scrimmage per game Christian McCaffrey is is a Hall of Fame level talent. Um, let's just be real, because when you look at yards of scrimmage per game, the only guys he's behind is like Jim Brown, Barry Sanders. Um, he's tied with Terrell Davis. Okay, uh, maybe the greatest pure running back. Maybe I mean I, it's hard to argue against Barry Sanders because Barry Sanders right. was so electrifying. But but Barry Sanders no. also had a lot of runs for loss. Terrell Davis was just a monster that it was like he was always going to get you three yards and he could also get you eighty five yards. So right. I mean, but 
he's tied. It's fun to say. It's fun to say this guy is on our team. Like it's right. unbelievable. So I mean, j- so just think about the the impact that Terrell Davis had on the Broncos. When you look at you know, people, John Elway gets a lot of credit for those ni- for the ninety seven and ninety eight Broncos. When you look at the um, when you look at the at his numbers, he's like sixty percent passing completion. It's like thirty seven, thirty eight hundred yards. It's 21st and 22nd in the league in passing attempts. Terrell Davis is rushing for 2,000 yards. Terrell Davis was the meat of that offense, and it was a Shanahan offense, okay? So start Christian McCaffrey. Bench, I'm going to say Nick Bosa. Uh, I love Fred Warner. I love Fred Warner. I mean, now, again, this is this is Desert Island kind of, this will never happen kind of stuff, but Again, impact on the entire defense. Just think about what it was in 2019 when we had Bosa, what our defense looked like. In 2020, we did not have Bosa and what our defense looked like. Okay? Fred Warner is an all-pro linebacker. If it push came to shove, if it was Bosa or Warner, I'm taking Bosa. Um, and, And that's what it comes down to. You can't be without Christian McCaffrey at this point because of the impact on the offense. And if you have Bosa on defense and you have McCaffrey on offense, you will be competitive in a lot of games. If you don't have McCaffrey on offense and you have Bosa and Warner on defense, you might still lose a lot of games because your offense is is garbage. Um, you know, not I wouldn't say garbage, but uh, you know, <laughs> just the impact of McCaffrey. So that's my my start bench cut is start McCaffrey bench Bosa cut. Warner. It is just painful to even say these things, man. You're, Agonizing. You're you're a, you're that's sadistic. Yep. So great job with those. Uh, we will see you every Monday and Thursday throughout these playoffs. 4 p.m. on the west side, 7 p.m. on the east side. So if you're in California, if you're near Santa Clara, where our beloved Niners play, you can catch us 4 p.m. If you are on the East Coast by New York, you can catch us 7 p.m. Link is in the show notes to all of our social medias, all the different ways to get a hold of us. Again, Johnny Dell's Football Academy at gmail.com. If you would like to email us a question or get a hold of us, tell us we're awesome, tell us where our takes were terrible, whatever. We love to hear from you guys. And we will catch you Thursday.